Hi, I'm Josh Goding, uh, here with my friend Tyler Smith, and we are back as part of our series of discussing films and media. Um, today we're going to be talking about the theme of older is better. And what we mean by you that is... You don't completely agree with me on that. Yeah, I think we might kind of butt heads and this should be an interesting show. Yeah. So you had some strong opinions about the media that has come before and yeah. decades before now. I think we've both been expressing some disappointment in movies yeah. that have been coming yeah, out yeah, and, and music. I, and I want to I <clears> draw a line. Basically, I'm saying the last 10 years mm -hmm. is where I'm drawing the line at. Even though there's kind of... Uh, around the time of Star Wars, Blade Runner there, mm -hmm. there was definitely kind of a cutoff where things were getting worse. But the last 10 years, I think, we were starting to get close to rock bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, ter in terms of what we're seeing in it's, movies and TV. That's not hard to agree with. And I, and I think, especially, right before the show started, you mentioned, you know, this trend um, of making movies from comic books. Yeah. Which, although very entertaining, which seems to mean... Okay, so we're getting away from making movies based on literature, or yeah. based on novels, which... Yeah. Um, you or based, to, based on ideas. Based on ideas. And so instead, they're based on graphic novels or comic books, which are lend themselves to a movie format, because they're already drawn out yeah. in uh, frames and such. They're already storyboarded. Yeah, already storyboarded. <laughs> um, but it kind of... And they're very entertaining, and I like them for what they are, but it kind of is maybe symbolic of the of laziness the and the sort of the problem of of what we're seeing in media and movies, and so. Well, well first off, I'd like to uh, quote Mark Borderland. He wrote a book called The Dumbest Generation, and in this book he said, amongst high school students, 52% of them listed us as allies with Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Japan during World War II. And this is amongst high school students. And this is a multiple choice test. Yeah. So think about it for a moment. How many people got the answer right by accident? <laughs> As you get, yeah. to see, you get to see how, how, how bad the problem is. People, you know, but the thing is, people are spending too much time on Facebook, and they're not spending enough time reading books. Mm. You know, and, and part of the problem is, and, and some of the signs of this is in our art that we produce, particularly movie, television, and music. And there's a trend I like to call called Faster Louder. You know, in music or movies or TV, you know, we just make it faster and louder because there's no real substance there. You more see what more I'm cuts per minute. Yeah, more cuts. You know, and and part of the problem I want to talk about this for a second is uh, when when they do uh, TV shows like cartoons and stuff like that and mm -hmm. movies too, mm -hmm. they have this thing set up where they'll have a camera like here and they'll have another camera here and one will be the show that they're watching and the other will be like random pictures and. And they'll be watching the eyes of the viewer, and if they go off for a second to look at something else, they're like, we've lost them. You know, so they know they need to cut there. Right? Is this like a, a test audience technology that yeah, you're talking yeah, yeah. about? Okay. Yeah, so, so they're trying to have us glued to the screen, whether mm -hmm. it's the TV screen or the movie screen, mm -hmm. every second, every frame. Right. You know, without losing our attention for one moment. So that the EEG shows that you're getting bored and then they know they're going to take it back to their editors and, what, make a new cut? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, just keep it moving along. Yeah. You know, they, they don't want to lose your attention at all. You know, in the old days, they used to screen a movie and they, they would have people watch the audience to see where they're starting to lose them. And then they would know they needed to make changes there, or they, they didn't know that the movie was unreleasable. Mm. You, see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It was either unreleasable, or we need to make changes. We need to tighten up the parts where we're losing them, where they're getting bored. They've been but doing now, this for a while, haven't yeah, they? Oh, yeah, yeah. they have, but the now cards. they're taking it to a whole new level mm -hmm. to where it's like you watch these films and you're glued to the screen from beginning to end. And even myself. Someone who's a filmmaker and knows all the tricks. Yeah. It's like I watched The Scorpion King. And of these types of films, this is the one I actually even liked a little bit. Yeah. You know, I actually watched it all the way to the end. But I'm 90 minutes into the film, and all of a sudden it occurs to me, I haven't seen even 10 seconds of character development right. <laughs> the story. Yet. You've just been sucked into it's the... It's uh, one crisis roller coaster ride after roller coaster. another. So they, they have a formula for keeping you engaged, and that's to... Slow down a little bit, and then speed up, speed up, speed up, yeah, and yeah, slow yeah. down a little bit. And, and, they've, yeah, and they throw you one crisis after another, and mm -hmm. it just keeps coming, zip, 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 zip. Right. And, and then I realized that there's no real arc to this story. It's just, like we it's, talked it's about just in, a series of gags one after another, a series of tricks. I know the Scorpion King, too. And like we talked about in our, uh, we're talking about Star Trek, Why is it Dumb? Yeah. Um, the new Star Trek. 
mm. how you could come away from a movie like Into Darkness mm -hmm. being completely entertained, but then an hour later have completely forgotten. Yeah, 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 what, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's funny because it's like you're completely engaged in the film while you're watching <laughs> it. And just minutes after walking out of the theater, it's completely washed from your consciousness. Yeah. I was watching, I walked out of that Star Trek film where the, uh, the Romulans come back in time with Nero. And someone asked me, as I was walking out of the theater, what the movie was about. And I said, I don't remember. Yeah. And they said, you just came out of the film. <laughs> <laughs> Said, yeah, but, but a bad sign. That there's a lot of explosions and running around, <laughs> you know, and uh, I just walked out of the movie, and I, I Spock was beating somebody up. I don't know. I, you know, I, and, and, and I'd already forgot. Yeah. Every you know everything that was in it. You know, nothing stayed with me. Right. You know, you know, um, Mark. I, I'm trying to remember his name. Stephen J. York. He wrote a very interesting review of Silent Running, where he talked about that. He says. You'll be in, most movies you'll be engaged in the moment, but it watches from your consciousness years later. He said, mm -hmm. Silent Running is one of the few films that I watched where it stayed in my brain, in my yes. heart, in my psyche, years after I watched it, and demanding you go back and recheck it out. And he said he did that decades later when some other people were talking about it, yeah. figuring it wouldn't hold up. And as he's watching the film, he's like, oh my God. This is much better than I originally remembered. Right. Like, right. The best movie is we can go back and watch them many times, and even after we're no longer surprised by the story, let's say, but we're still you can moved analyze. by the arc of the story. Yes, and then you know because it has real and, issues in it. It has real characters. It has real integrity to it. Or at the very least, there'd be technique that you'd be yeah, learning yeah, from. Yeah, or at least, yeah. But we're emotionally moved by it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because I've seen the movie Alien. I don't know how many times, mm. but every time I see that scene. Where the aliens like attacking Parker and Lambert, mm -hmm. you know, when you finally get a good look at what that thing looks like, my hair. The first time I saw that, my hair stand stood on end, <laughs> and it still does. Yeah, I'm like, oh my god, that thing is scary looking. <laughs> or in that film, you can watch it now, even you know the first quarter, let's say before mm -hmm. the alien shows up, and realize you can appreciate just how atmospheric and how well done. Yeah, it and, really and, is, and how good the character development is. It's part mm -hmm. of the problem that Alien actually had, mm -hmm. and this is rare for a horror film. It was actually too subtle for its own good in some ways. Yeah. And by that I mean, in the film Alien, they were weaving in all these things that don't seem to be important in the first half of the movie, yeah. but turn out to be very important in the second half. You know, they're, they're showing there's a crew of seven, it's a skeleton crew, and they're also showing these people hate each other. Yeah. They don't trust each other. They're in hell. This, yeah. th th this is a nightmare. These people don't work together well. They don't like each other. They don't trust each other. And then now they've got to fight together. Right. And it you're, you're working with the, a crew that, that, that you don't trust and hate. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's a nightmare scenario. So contrasted with today's movies and media, which are dumbed down, rehashed, cynically sort of calculated to appeal to the dumbest generation. Well, yeah, so. well, well, part of the problem is they keep trying to hit the medium, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying, of the mass audience to try and maximize the amount of money. And they know that a lot of the people that watch movies are tweens, you know, like 12, 13-year-old yes. boys. So they're targeting them. But they're making stuff that's just, it's just terrible because they're, plus they're sending out the wrong message to young boys. Mm. And they did studies on this. If you, kids, when they're growing up, they need, their minds need to be shaped. They need to be shaped the right way. If you keep programming a kid that he's going to be entertained every 10 seconds, you see what I'm saying? His brain will be wired that way for the rest of his life. Yes. And that's a very bad thing. Kids need to learn patience. You know, and, and the, it's sending the wrong message. It's like I said, it's louder, faster. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's like... So a you have a, you're talking about a vicious cycle of sorts. Where yeah, yeah, exactly. The mm -hmm. media. And, and the, the thing is, is... Uh, uh, we, we're also experiencing something I like to call creative fatigue. And let me mm -hmm. explain what that is. Sure. Okay, uh, when we did the movie North by Northwest, we set the film, we had the big climax at Mount Rushmore. Yeah. You know? And then when we did A View to a Kill, you know, we had the big finale at uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. You I remember see what that, I'm right up on the cables. Yeah, 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 on the cables. And it's <laughs> like. We're running out of things to dazzle the audience. Yeah, with. now what? Well, you know, it's like now what? It's like Star Wars when it came out. There was a new level of sci-fi technology 
that, that, that burst onto the screen that people have never seen before. They're razzle dazzled by it. But then after that, every film had that level of technology. Yes. And then we became bored with that too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like after the first two moon landings, by the time we went to the third one, by the time we got to Apollo 13, they didn't even show it on TV. People were tuning out we were in already droves. Bored. Yeah. We were already bored with going to the moon in outer space. We, well, we just done it. You right. know? It, 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 but the, the fatigue is in other areas too, like story ideas. Mm -hmm. Hollywood just keeps rehashing stories that they know work, making carbon copies of them. Like these How, remakes that we've re seen, or, oh, so many or remakes. Or even rehashes, like A Bug's Life was mm. a rehash. Not really a true remake, but a rehash of Seven Samurai. Okay. You, you see, you see what I mean? And it's it's it, they they do this so often because they know this worked once. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? So we're gonna do it again. It's and it's sort of it, it falls to that idea of like, there's only there's there's a finite number of stories out there. There's a finite number of plots, which I don't necessarily agree. I don't with. agree with that, but but the finite ones that Hollywood we know that work seems to agree. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly it. It's this is a cynical calculation of this has worked and it will work again if we put in these new trappings and get some CGI on there yeah. and yeah. And, and, and let me give you another example of this. When I was watching Terminator two, three. Okay. Okay. They had the scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger is holding on to the crane during the car, car chase. Yeah. And he's holding on to the end of the crane, and they swing the crane out into uh, a car dealership, into the glass windows. You know, and it's it's like it's exciting and everything, but it's like we see this all the time. There's something that ante again. Yeah. Yeah. They keep trying to up the ante, but it's like, but but as you're watching it, it's like you're kind of enjoying it, but at the same time, it's like. Right. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's, it just becomes more of the same. Yeah, and then the next movie he'll be parkouring on a unicycle on the back of a truck <laughs> on the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, they just, yeah, you know. You know, it, it's like how far are we going to take this? Mm -hmm. it, it, but, the th but, but my point is, is, you look at Shakespeare, you look at Shakespeare's plays, it's hard to beat a really good drama mm -hmm. that has real issues, real character development. I mean, you can't beat that. Yeah. You know, with special effects and CGI and tricks. You see, see what I'm saying? That and didn't I think change. Th that we really need to go back mm -hmm. to telling really good dramas. Yeah, storytelling, that's, that's part of the human condition. And, and we all want to tell the stories that we have. We also want to be entertained by other stories. And we, as a species, like to watch. And so nothing can beat a really well-crafted tale and character development. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter. With real issues at the core of it that we mm -hmm. care about. You know, it's interesting. One of the things people said about the movie Silent Running was after they watched it, people debated the film. Yeah. You know, if you were, it, what would you do if you were in Freeman Wolf's situation? Yeah, there's some it, real it, ideas it, there. You know, yeah. would you kill your other crewmates? Mind, mind it, he didn't like these guys. They didn't like him, you yeah. know. But even so, you know, he, he doesn't want to be alone and not, not have anyone to talk to at the same time. Right. You know, so, 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 so th there were real issues at the core of that. And some people said, you know, I would have tried to trap them. You know, <laughs> I would have killed them. Okay. But they would have still done the same thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? And other people said, one guy said, I would have killed all three of them the day we got the order <laughs> to walk the domes. And I would have took off. With the six domes we had right. before they blew up even one of them. Right. <laughs> you know, Talking so about the film Silent Running. Silent so, Running, yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, if, if you have real issues there, people will be debating these years. Right. Or generations. Or like in our um, in our discussion of 2001, we just we touched on the the mystery, mm -hmm. and even now, having we've each watched that movie maybe a hundred times between yeah. us. Um, we could go back and watch that and still be I equally enamored. I could watch that every day. I actually watch that film every day. Yeah, I, think yeah, I, I love it so much. Yeah. You, know? you know, Alien's a movie I'll put on when I'm like putting my shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I like that movie so much. Yeah. Because it's not rushed. You know, a lot of, you know, it's interesting. I want to talk about this for a second. Jeremy Johns, he, he's a film critic on YouTube. Mm -hmm. He's a very popular one. He did a review of Alien. He did a review of Aliens. And he gave the film only a mediocre review. Okay. And he said... The first one? The first one, yeah. Mm -hmm. The second one, he gave it an awesome tacular. Okay. It's like, it's like his review is, uh, if he really loves it, awesome tacular. If, if it's just kind of good, 
he gives it a review of no alcohol required. Okay. And that's what he gave to Ailey in the first <laughs> film. And he said, because the first ha hour of it is so slow. The first half of it is so sl painfully slow. Now I love it, though, to yeah, watch but, it. But, but I prefer that over zip, zip, bang, bang, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I have to put up with with all these other films. All style and no substance. Yeah, or exactly. All, or it, even it's like poor watching, style. It, it's like... Watching a two-hour-long MTV video, music, yeah. music video, zip, 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 boom, boom, boom. And, and after a while, it just becomes tiresome. And then sequel after sequel of how many Fast and Furious movies have We're there been? We're on six you now. Know. We're on six. Um, you know, films like, based on um, childhood toys from the 80s. Yeah, G.I. Yeah. G. Joe has oh, got yeah. two movies out now. Oh, yeah. It, 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 and that's, that's the problem I was talking about. The people that are making these decisions, they grew up on comic books. They grew up on slot TV. Now they people grew up running on great literature. Studios. They grew up on junk. Yeah. And now they're giving us more junk. They grew up on video games. You get movies in the veil of video games now. Like Mortal Kombat was made to a movie. Think Mario about Brothers what's going to happen to the movies when the people that are children now are the ones making the films. What will they possibly I'm be like? I'm frightened to think of the consequences. <laughs> It'll be it's some like, sort of how could it get worse? Interactive right? video game with, with no character it development. Will it be like an idiocracy yeah. where, where, you know, he goes to see a movie of the theater. The movie's called Ass. <laughs> and all it is is an hour and a half of a close-up of an ass farting. <laughs> And people laugh because they're watching this it. This is their, their idea you know, of entertainment. I, I think right? we'll, 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 everything will be reduced to jackass. That, that's stuff where like we're that. headed, probably. Yeah, and, but, but it's interesting because if you look at... I saw the remake of Khan and the Barbarian. I had to turn it off after like 10 minutes. I couldn't watch it anymore. Oh, because, yeah. Because it was just too cut, 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 zip, zip, zip. There was no character development there. And I, ju I just couldn't watch it anymore. I, I, you know, I just threw in the towel after like 10 minutes, maybe even five. That was it awful. Was so that terrible. looked like a sci-fi movie, a sci-fi channel movie yeah. of the week or something. Too. Yeah, that was, that was really bad. You, you know, a friend of mine, Steve, uh, Steve Doval, he was talking about Lawrence of Arabia. You know, we were watching Lawrence of Arabia and Zulu. We were saying movies like this can't even get made anymore. By the great David Lean. Yeah. And, and uh, who did Dr. Zhivago. Yeah, and, and, uh, <coughs> and, and Bridge of Kwai. Right. And what happens is, with films like Lawrence of Arabia, they spend time just taking in the scenery. Mm -hmm. You know, something unthinkable today, <laughs> you know, where you, you spend like 30 seconds just looking out at the desert. Right. You know, with, with like some music played in the background as you're doing it, as you're traveling. Unthinkable today. And that film had the 70 millimeter versions, the yeah. CinemaScope, yeah. and so... But the scenes are breathtaking. Mm-hmm. You know, they're absolutely perfect. Zulu, which got uh, didn't get near as many Oscars as Lawrence of Arabia, it was a kind of a medium budget film. But it had scenes where they took in the scenery, you know, mm -hmm. of Africa, the area that you're around. And that really sucks you in to the story, feeling you're really there. A lot of di a lot of times these days you may not have Actual photography, so you may have a CG or a set extension yeah. that I think you pick up on a subconscious level that this is not an actual environment. Well, yeah, yeah, or, you know, um, you might not uh, do it intellectually, but your heart knows. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't connect with it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Near as well as it does with a, a real image with real pixels. Uh, that's that's one of the things. Is uh, there's a big trend now actually in science fiction to go back to in camera shots with models. Yes. Because the older stuff actually looks a lot better than yeah. the newer stuff. There's photographic textures there that they still can't get, even with the highest rendered, yeah. you know, 2K or, or whatever they're Well, well the doing. thing is also when you're building a model, there are going to be flaws in it. Mm -hmm. You know, and those flaws add a detail to it that yeah. makes it seem more real, even if they're tiny. Like a... Verisimilitude. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, Dan Quayle was actually calling for Hollywood to set a higher standard. He, he was, you know, saying we need to get away from the 10-second attention span to 12-year-olds. We yes. need to have stories that are morality tales. You know, and we need to... Vice President Dan Quayle? Dan, Dan okay. Quayle, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was calling on Hollywood, you, you know, to raise the bar. Couldn't hurt. Well, well, you, you know, it's like, man, I, I might vote for Dan Quayle <laughs> the next election after hearing that. You yeah. know? That, that was kind of my response to it. Maybe we've underrated this guy, you know? But, but, but you know, part of the problem is if you look at the Hollywood studio execs, a lot of these guys actually are know-nothings. You know, 
you know, and they've been raised on yeah. slock. So they're giving us more slock. Uh, let me tell you something. In uh, a lot of people who ran Hollywood in the early days, they were Jews who came up the hard way, but they were educated. And they had studied the classics, and they wanted to do great works. You know, there was that desire to win awards and to do great works that will be remembered down through the ages. Film was still really struggling to find its place to justify itself as an art form yeah. in society, and it was really... They were trying to do a lot they better. They were trying to do that. They're not trying so hard now. They're, they're not trying at all. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just trying to make money. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's all been reduced to how much money can I make? But back then, um, the golden age of Hollywood and beyond, um, you know, film was an all-encompassing art form. It, it, it included comprised literature, photography, theater, uh, acting, you know, all, all the different forms. Were well, well, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that I noticed in Hollywood over the years is originally the ambition of the writers and the directors was very good. The skill level of them, but the skill level of the actors actually wasn't very good on average. Yeah. And it wasn't really about till the 50s, I'm talking about America, uh, American cinema, that the, that the acting started to get pretty good. And But the thing is, is the acting in this country, each decade has gotten better. But the writing at the same time has taken a nosedive. I can see that, yeah. Yeah, and now they're actually training actors to give good performances in really badly written material <laughs> for their auditions. Yeah. I'm not making this up. You know, they're telling them this is what you're going to get. You're going to get crap, very poorly written stuff, and you've got to breathe life into Somehow, it. Somehow, yeah, get something out of this. Yeah, and uh, it, it's too bad. But the thing is, to be a self-actualized person, you really need a broad base of knowledge. You need to read books. You need to study the classics, and you need to go out and experience something of life. Mm. And the thing is, is the people who were running Hollywood in the early days, I mean, some of these people were stowaways on boats <laughs> to get to America. Mm. And then they had to jump ship when they got close to the shore <laughs> and make a swim for it. You know, these people had real-life interesting experiences to draw from. Right. And they had, a, they had an agenda. They had a passion. It's like, I suffered through all this. I'm going to make something of myself. I'm going to make great works in Hollywood Okay. when I get there. And many of them did. Billy Wilder, you know, was an example of that. He was actually a foreigner. And he almost got kicked out of this country for being a foreigner. But he's just barely just allowed to stay in. And he did, you know, films like Dialogue 17. You know, he did Some Like It Hot, you know. And these are just a few of his, right. you know, great works that he achieved. You know, James Dr Gray, he's a movie director. He went so far as to say Americans no longer know how to tell good stories. He said, go to the movies, they're terrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and he said part of the problem is, is that we've been fed, the audience has been fed such a huge diet of junk food for so long that if, oh, is that out there? No. Okay. That if we, uh, if we give the audience something really good. If we give them sushi, they're going to spit it out and say, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? uh -huh. And I mean, and part of the problem is it's also a market-driven economy. And, and to add to the problem on top of everything else, right now, Hollywood has, you know, the film industry has been losing its market share to the internet, to video games. Sure. So they're trying desperately to uh, well, and, and television, HBO, cable, you know. So 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 films so are becoming Hollywood. a lot more like video games in their presentation. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, a lot of films are becoming video games in the veil of a film. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that's another frightening trend. You know, and you, you got the Transformer movies that are basically two-hour toy commercials. Right. They're toys in the under the veil of being a movie. Uh, I mean, and part of the problem is we just have movies that just keep uninspiredly carbon copying things. Right. And they just keep going for the lowest common denominator. And part of the problem is I think the people in Hollywood genuinely don't really have any real, nothing to say. Because they, mm -hmm. have, they, they have no real issues that they're passionate about. The only thing they're passionate about, I think, is really making money. And, you know, hanging out the Playboy Mansion. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, it, you know, it, it's like when I saw Attack of the Clones. You know, I was like, 
clones is right. <laughs> this is a clone sure. of what we've seen before, you know? And, and part of the problem, I think, is that uh, when Kurosawa wrote Seven Samurai, he had a team of writers with him. And one of the writers' job, and this was his only job in the film, it, 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 on the script, was to say to the other writers, no, you're cheating. Mm -hmm. No, you're doing it wrong. No, you have to change that. You see what I'm saying? I, I mean, there, there, there doesn't seem to be that anymore. No, these, you get these guys who have made a lot of money for the studio, and then they're in this egotistical, egotistical position of mm. not having anyone telling them when they're messing up, I mm -hmm. think. Well, we were talking about with George Lucas going Elvis crazy, mm -hmm. and he's so rich and he's so isolated. It's like no one's going to say no to him. Yeah, you know. I and mean, as an example of, that's someone who started in the camp of those things that we used to think were good or were better for being older, and now yeah. stuff that they were doing more recently yeah. has not been so good at all. Yeah, but but I think we really have to go back to realizing that movies and film and television are they need to be morality tales. There has to be some lesson mm -hmm. from this journey that we can learn something from. You know, otherwise, it's all just more zip, bang, boom, you know. And, uh, you know, you, you can add all the CGI you want. You can add all the special effects, explosions and action and disaster porn. But unless there's a real human story with real issues in there, it's about nothing. I suppose there's another class, too, where that's... It's more of an aesthetic experience, so you, you want to leave room for art films that are not necessarily trying to tell a traditional narrative, but what you have is a, a focus on form and aesthetics yeah. instead. Well, you know, what I think is interesting, if you look at a movie like <clears throat> Alien, it really was a fluke because it, was, it really was an art film. Mm -hmm. That ended up being a blockbuster. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, it was one of those rare flukes. Most people don't realize that, but th that film was actually intended as, as a drama first. Mm -hmm. It was intended as a science fiction film second and a horror movie third. Mm -hmm. But but the first third of the movie is the character develop. I mean, the first half of the movie is most of the character development, where Dan O'Banion is, is explaining to the audience these people are making bad mistakes one after right. another. And it goes unnoticed by a lot of the viewers. You, you see what I'm saying? Why don't we touch on some of the movies that yeah. you are identifying as being classics mm -hmm. and that you think typify what is best in film? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I will in one second, but I want to say one more thing about... Uh, 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 if you look at history, and Plutarch said this, unless... Unless you understand history, unless you have that broad base of knowledge, and we don't seem to have that anymore in our society, <clears throat> you live in a society that's in a perpetual state of adolescence. And I think the films that we're seeing are a byproduct of that in the movies and television shows and art. you got to see more films. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I try to keep up with what's going on, but, but I I've think, been so um, disappointed. There are some really great auteurs in today's film that are redeeming all the garbage that's going oh, really? on in Hollywood. But I, mean, I, I, um, I, 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 haven't, I haven't caught them yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you'll have to point some of them out to me. But well, if you look at film auteurs like Paul Thomas Anderson, mm -hmm. well, what, um, what are some of the ones he did? Ang Lee. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson did Magnolia more recently. He did The Master. He did There Will Be Blood. Daniel okay, Day-Lewis. Okay, I saw that. That was good. Um, these that, are that actually was, that actually masterful. was good. Think, you still have people that you are trying to make real film, are, and thank are, God for are, that. But, but There Will Be Blood was an art film. I think you'll agree with mm -hmm. me on that. Sure. And, um, and it was a very good art film. Then you have auteurs... By the way, I love There Will Be Blood. Auteurs like uh, Alfonso Cuaron, who is a Mexican director, but he is riding the line between art film and commercial pop films, I mm -hmm. guess, with yeah. films like Gravity. Yeah. Um, Peter Jackson is also writing a line of pop and technology, you know, mm -hmm. pushing technology, but also, mm -hmm. you know, is steeped in the traditions of filmmaking. But I think that I would argue uh, that uh, these guys are good because they have not rejected mm -hmm. those ideas from the past. And these are yeah. educated filmmakers who are steeped in film yeah. lore. They're not these fly-by-night 20-somethings that you're talking about yeah. who grew up on comic books, probably. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so <laughs> there are a few good ones still out there. I, I would like to talk about some of the earlier films that were done particularly well and what we can learn from them. Okay. And let's start with the very earliest one of our, on our list, Metropolis. Uh-huh. 
And, you know, I watched the movie Metropolis. The first time I saw it, I was just absolutely blown away by this film. The reason I was blown away by the movie was this movie was made in about 1910. And they're predicting the future that I'm living in now. Mm -hmm. And you see the city of Metropolis, and it looks like a modern city as we know it now. You know, and they have the music that goes with it. And it, the music's very upbeat. It's very uplifting. And it looks like we've created this utopian fu futuristic world. But then as the film progresses, you see this <coughs> huge labor class that has to keep the city going. Yeah. And these guys are being exploited, and they're working their asses off, and their lives are miserable. Now, the creator... I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Fritz Lang was the creator of that film. Who was a German from the German Expressionist yeah. uh, camp, and so, but he, was he an American filmmaker by the time? No, okay. well, not at that time. He was actually uh, working in Germany. Okay. This was a German film. Okay. But, but I'm watching the movie Metropolis, and it's like, there are real issues in this film. Yeah. And I'm completely sucked into them, and there's none of this zip, bang, boom, going for the cheap excitement effect. There's a... There's a, a real seedy story. underworld in in the film. Well, oh, yeah. The, the the thing is, is is at first you think you're in this like utopian world, and then you see this working class going to these elevators and this transportation system to go to work and come back and forth all the time. Yeah. And you see them in these factories just sweating away, working, and they're playing the music, and then they dissolve from that scene to a scene of like a stairway going to hell. Yeah. You know. <laughs> We're going, the people working here, they're, they're on their way to hell. Right. You know, they're in it, or they're in hell, actually, yes. is, is what, what he's saying. And I, as I was watching that, I was just blown away by the daring, the innovation, mm -hmm. the originality of it. And I got it emotionally. Right. I was like, Very oh, effective. my God. You know, uh -huh. it's like, how many times have I ever experienced something like that in a movie? Right. Ever. You know, I mean... And the thing was, was the movie, is it's not a film that has a couple of really good scenes and then it doesn't hold up overall altogether. The point the movie makes, the movie was, they say about science fiction, it's trying to prevent the future, not predict it. Mm. This movie was actually pre trying to predict the future and prevent it, both at the same time. Yeah. And it did a very good job on both counts. The thing is, is they, they actually act accurately predicted the future, but they also said... As the message and the moral of the film, that you're, you've got to not abuse your working class. You know, that was the message of the film. And yeah. you walk away with that. And you don't walk away with it in some kind of silly David Lynch-like way. You mm -hmm. know, you get it emotionally. Yeah. You know, it works intellectually. And, that and, and the film becomes a touchstone for all the science fiction uh, people to follow. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. well, they, 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 took inspiration they, they, they raised the bar. It's what, you know, mm -hmm. and now you got to live up to it. And that's the thing. I don't think very many films ever have lived up to Metropolis. You know, it still stands alone as one of, as a masterpiece. You know, if I had to list the ten best science fiction films of all time, I think I'd put Metropolis on the list even to this day. I mean, it's that Well, good. I think it's, it's, tough to, it's tough to watch it. As you'd watch a contemporary film, but I think if you enter into it with the proper sensibility well, and the expectation... Thing, the thing, the thing but... was, was I was able to get into the wavelength of the film the way the filmmakers wanted me to. And that's why I love the film so much. The uh -huh. same way I was able to do that with 2000 Worth Space Odyssey. I didn't fight it. Yeah. I went with it. Right. And, when, and, and in going with it, I had the emotional epiphany of my life. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I was deeply moved by these films. And that's in contrast to movies like from today, yeah. which would be different how? Well, uh, they have nothing to say. They're just a series of cheap tricks and gags. Yeah. You know, Damien, he, he was an actor I worked with on The Experiment. He was in Apocalypse Now, a lot of films. And he said, he said about movies today, he said, if I, if I see more than two explosions in your trailer, then your movie's about explosions. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's basically the problem. Your movie's about... Cheap thrills. They're about excitement, yeah. but they have no real story to say. They it's have about no uh, it's about selling popcorn. Yeah, and keeping it's it a crunching. Popcorn movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, it's about excitement. It's not about substance. That's the problem. Yes. Y you know, and I'd like to talk about another science fiction movie that I think was really quite good. But we're not going to just do sci-fi. Uh, Andromeda Strain. Now, talk about a movie that that has a very slow pacing by today's standards. Yes. 
But as I was watching it, man, I was sucked into this movie every frame of the film. You know, I, I think it's I, is it based on Michael Crichton? Yeah, I think, I think okay. so. One of his. He's written a lot of the the better sci-fi uh, movies and some of the worst ones too. Yeah, but 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 this was this was probably his best work actually. Yeah. Hands <laughs> down, I would give it his best work. But but in the Andromeda strain, you've got like this meteorite that hits Earth, and there's like this space virus on there, mm. and it's killed everyone in this town, this small Midwest town. Except for two people. Right. And what happens is the two people are very different from each other. They don't seem to have any of the same conditions or taking the same medicine. So it's like, how, what do these two people have in common? And they, they got to figure it out. And they, they figure it out that Andromeda strain can only survive in a very narrow base between acid and base. Mm. And one person had too much acid in them and the other person had too much base in them. You know, that's why they couldn't figure out what they had in common. Okay. So that was what was tr tricking them for all that time. And once they figured out how it worked, then they were able to defeat it at that point. Right. But it was interesting because the movie was saying, asking the question, are we smart enough to survive in this universe that mm -hmm. we live in? And the answer is, maybe not. <laughs> 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 you know, we just, you know, the thing was, in the film, we just barely made it through that. Got it. You know, it was a very close call, and it easily could have gone the other way. But to me, that was a very interesting story idea. And they didn't do it in a way where you had someone at the end come out, come out and say, this is the message of the movie. They uh -huh. just presented the information, and you either got it or you didn't. You know, that was one of the problems I had with... Uh, the remake of Seven Samurai, uh, The Magnificent Seven. I, I mean, overall, I like the film, but at the end, they had to dumb it down so much to make sure that the dumbest person in the audience got it. <laughs> got the well, message. do movies have to convey these moral platitudes, or can they do something else? Well, I think if they're to have any substance, if they're to be any good, they have to be morality tales. There's no other way around it. You know, it's the difference between night and day, uh, life or death. Yes. You know, it's like... You, 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 so to be a great film. To be a great film, or even a good film. You've got to have some good ideas in there. Yeah, you, you, have to have a, you have to have a message and a moral, you know, <clears throat> that's worth telling. And I would like to talk about... I wanted to talk about some TV shows, because some of them were really quite okay. good. Okay, good TV and, and film. And uh, you remember the show Three's Company, John Ritter? I'm afraid so. Yeah. You know, that show actually got two Emmys. Two, count them. And they got it from the same episode. Oh. And Dan O'Banion, the writer of Alien, wrote the episode. Are you kidding me? No. Okay. And what was happened... Was there any science fiction involved? No, no, no. <laughs> it wasn't science fiction at all. He was a fan of Don Knotts. He liked Don Knotts. Okay. They were friends. Right. So he wrote this episode for him. And the episode's called I'm Not That Bad. And in the episode, this was the interesting thing about it. It was a morality tale. In the episode, Don Knotts forms up this baseball team. And they lose every game they play. You know, they're just an amateur team. There's no money involved. But they, they lose every game, and he's the worst player on the team. But he formed up the team. And now everyone wants him off the team because they see him as a liability, the team that he formed up. So they get together with John Ritter, who's also on the team, and they, they want Ritter to tell them that he's off the team and Ritter's the new leader of the team. Mm -hmm. And Ritter agrees with this. And he talks with one of the ladies who sees his roommate saying that, you know, you've got to kick him off and you've got to be strong, you know. You know, don't you know? Don't don't let compa You know, don't let compa Don't let your feelings affect your better judgment. Okay. So he promises her that he's not going to change his mind or, or weaken. Right. You know, so he goes to the park with the other three guys that are on the team to tell him he's off the team. And Don Knotts is heartbroken. <laughs> he's like, Oh come on! He can't kick me off of my own team that I started. Right. He just can't do it. You know, he tells him, Look, my wife has left me. You know, my kids aren't talking to me. <laughs> you, know, you know, I have nothing in my life to look forward to. I have nothing that I enjoy except doing this baseball team. Okay. And he's like, but we're, we're losing. He's like, losing's not a big deal. I've lost my whole life. I've never wanted anything. Right. You know, it's all like, you know, there's no money involved. Right. You know, uh, you know, I've lost and then I noticed... You know, water still tastes sweet, food still tastes good, <laughs> life still goes on. Right. Losing's not a big deal. And, 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 and Ritter realizes that this is all the only happiness he has left in his life. Mm. 
You know, and if you take that away from a man, who knows what he'll do? You see what I'm saying? He might even kill himself. He has, he has nothing to look forward to. Yeah. So Ritter changes his mind and decides to keep him on the team. Okay. You know, he, he goes against his promise that he made earlier. And he and, and one of the guys, after Ritter does that, you know, they're, they're, they're saying, it's up to you. You're the, you're the new leader. And he's like, okay, well, then if it's up to me, he's still on the team. And, and Don Knotts says, well, you won't regret this. He's like, I regret it already, but you're still on. <laughs> <laughs> and then he talks to the guys earlier, later, after he walks away, and they're like, we didn't want you to say that. You want, we wanted you to kick, kick him off. I said, well, you said it's up to me, so I made my decision. You know, right. now you're just going to have to live with it. And one of the guys threatens to, he says, oh, why don't I just go kick his ass and tell him to get lost? And Ritter says to it, if you try it, I'll kick yours. Mm-hmm. And the guy backs off, and one of the guys says, I guess you really are the leader now. He's like, yes, I guess I am. And then he has to explain to, to his roommate why he changed his mind and why it was the right decision to make. Okay. And he does it in a way the audience agrees with it. But, but the, the thing that's interesting about the episode is, as you're watching it, most of the audience is on Ritter for kicking Don Knotts off the team. Mm-hmm. But as they watch it further, they're like, no, he made the wrong decision. And he shouldn't let his pride of making that promise mm-hmm. keep him from making the right decision now. And he explains that to the person he, he talked to. Yeah. And Ritter didn't want to even do the episode because he said there's no laughs in it. Oh. It's not funny. And, they, and they, they basically told him, you're an actor, you're a paid employee, you don't have any choice. Uh-huh. You can't afford to say no to us, you can't afford to offend us. Just do what we tell you. And right. Ritter backed off. He did the episode. He got the Emmy that year. First time he'd ever even been nominated. But he got the Emmy, won the award. Yeah. And Ritter said, huh, <laughs> that felt pretty good. Okay, so why is this a good example? Because it's a morality media. tale that we can learn from. Mm-hmm. That if you make a promise that's wrong, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You shouldn't go through with that promise. Right. You know, and that's, and you shouldn't take, you, you shouldn't take away Someone's last crumb of happiness. Yeah. You know, over something as trivial as winning or losing a baseball game. You know? Right. That was... The, so there was... There was but a, I know you're not reducing film and video down to, like, um, a didactic formula, meaning, like, that has to teach, or, you know, for example, if what if it's just a historical biopic that's really mm-hmm. wonderful, like Nicholas and Alexandria or something, or, or Lawrence of Arabia? Mm-hmm. Is there a message there? Or is oh, absolutely. That, okay, so... There were a lot of there were a lot of things we we can mm-hmm. learn from the film of Lawrence of Arabia mm-hmm. uh, on many different levels. Also militarily, the way they fought this war and won it. Uh, but you're saying but, that uh, the uh, filmmakers but, have purposely calculated as part of the code of the movie. They're including that because they want us to decode a message or a lesson. Well, they want us to learn something fr- th- from it, and they they should have that in there. Yeah. And, but the thing is, is Lawrence of Arabia. It has a lot of messages in there, and, and one of the messages is is that one person can make a huge difference. It was Lawrence's leadership that led to the victory, you see what I'm saying, in Africa against the Turks and their German allies. It was his guerrilla warfare campaign that he came up with Yeah. that turned the tide of the battle. But that later seems to lead to his, I guess, disappointment and... And, 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 and embitterment and downfall. Madness almost, yeah. Yeah, trauma from that. Yeah. Uh, he, well, he was disappointed in the outcome of events for various reasons, and so was King Faisal. Yes. And so were many of the Arabs. But at the same time, it's like they just had to deal with the reality of the situation. You know, it didn't work out. You know, it became a vi- bitter victory, in other words. Yeah. They won the war, but they didn't exactly get what they wanted, <laughs> you know, in the end, any of them. Well, let's work more on some evidence of why older is better. Well, well uh... I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about some other episodes that I thought were really quite good that we both liked, and that mm-hmm. was a TV episode of the new Twilight Zone called Future Trade. Remind me about Future Trade. Okay, uh, this guy, he works at a hardware store, he's unhappy with his life, and he's able to trade his life with someone else's life, and he trades his life with a guy who's a multi-millionaire salesman. Mm-hmm who lives in this expensive house and is making a fortune all the time. And it looks too good to be true. Yeah. And he's given something like 48 hours, or 24 hours, whatever it is, to change his mind if he wants to. Yes. And he lets that time elapse. And then he realizes why this guy wants out of this marriage. Mm -hmm. 
you know, once he's he, the time has elapsed, he cheated. The guy cheated on his wife. Yeah. His wife is furious with him, <laughs> and she wants to kill him, <laughs> and she does kill him. Except she doesn't kill him. She kills the guy who made the trade. Right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, you know, the message is, if it looks too good to be true, <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> you know, so there's a lesson learned in that. And it's also a lesson learned. Uh, he's trying to go the cheap way to success. Yeah. He's trying to get undue enrichment for something he doesn't deserve. Right. You see what I'm saying? And but uh, surely that but that's not the sole qualifier of what makes it good or what makes something classic. For example, Michael Bay might argue that Transformers has a theme, and that's that friendship is the greatest virtue, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Well, he... Michael Bay's theme is this. <laughs> Michael Bay's theme is mm. make the money. You know? Louder explosions are better. Yeah, well, more explosions, faster yes. explosions. <laughs> you, you know, Mark, you know, there was a song I heard. Mark Kermode, he's England's top film critic. This guy did a song about him. And he says, Mark Kermode, you make my day with all the things you say. He just slams Mike Bay's films one after oh, okay. another. And, he said, and, and the guy says to him, you wouldn't watch a movie by Michael Bay. No, you wouldn't give him the time of the day. <laughs> well, I hear um, Transformers 4 is in the works now. Oh, yeah. This one's on the moon or something uh, like that. I think they did that one. Oh, they did that yeah. already. This is another one. Well, we're, we're uh -huh. at Fast and Furious 6 now, aren't we? Yeah, and I'm even like excited by a movie Scorpion like... Um, King. How many Scorpion Kings do we have now? Or know? another X-Men where they, um, they're going to do the Star Trek Generations trick where they go back in, in X-Men, they're going to go back in the past and meet them, the former selves played by other actors. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually sort of looking forward to this one, and that sort of says like how, just how bad it is. <laughs> That's where you are What out point. there is, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I think... I, I, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is there are a lot of really good f older films, and I want to draw from Buck Rogers for a moment, because uh, the uh, movie that came out, it was actually a, a two-hour pilot that they made as a TV movie. Star Wars comes out. They hadn't released it yet. They release it, you know, right after Star Wars. Yeah. And it was kind of buried. It gets some momentum from Star Wars, but it was kind of buried. Uh, which one? Buck Rogers is 26th sure. Fifth Century with Gil Gerard, 1977. Okay, and so you had mentioned earlier that that came out, that there was the one hour or two hour pilot, I guess, for TV. Yeah, it was a two hour. It was also in, had a theatrical re release. Yeah, yeah, but they, they released it actually when, when Star Wars was a huge hit. They're mm. like, this looks like Star Wars, let's release this too. They were doing know? that a few times. They had Battlestar Galactica on the yeah. big screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They also, well, they released it on the small screen, then they released it on the big screen right after the two hour okay. pilot. Mm hmm. But the thing was about Buck Rogers' the 26th century, it actually was well written as yeah. a story. And it, the thing is, is about science fiction, science fiction, it's aimed at people who feel they are misfits in the society they live in. They feel they're outcasts. And they, you, you'll watch a journey of a character who is an outcast. Yeah. And then you, people who are outcasts tend to identify with that person and root for him. That's an interesting take on sci-fi. I hadn't yeah. quite put it well, that, like that. I, I yeah. used to read Starlog magazine all the time. This is one of the things that people who wrote the magazine said. So the characters are typically you know, aliens in the sense that they're, they are separated from the, the universe. They're marginalized in their they're own. Marginalized in some way. But, mm -hmm. but the thing was about Buck Rogers' character, he was someone who was, there was an accident. He's sent in outer space on a mission. He's frozen in time. Yep. And uh, in a state of, of hyper, hibernation, in, uh, deep sleep. And he comes back to Earth 500 years later, and he's woke, rudely woken up by the bad guys who see his ship, think it's an enemy ship, and they're about to attack it, and they realize, wait a minute, we don't hear, we need life form readings. Yeah. Let, let's, let's tow it and bring it on board and see what this is. And they, they spot him, and they bring him back to life from hibernation. And... Uh, the bad guys, the princess and the uh, empire, they think that uh, he's a very clever plant, a spy mm. sent. They're sort of like uh, barbarians in space. Type yeah, yeah, they're, thing, they're the know. bad guys. Yeah. They're, they're, they're conquering for the sake of conquering. And what happens is they decide to send him back, you know, figuring that, uh, that we're not going to take the bait. You see what I'm saying? Uh, they, think you know, they think they're being clever. A spy for the alliance. Yeah, well, well, we're going to tell them false information. Mm -hmm. and then we're going to send them back to his people. Right. We're going to tell them what we want them to think. Right. You know, that we have no weapons on our ship. But actually, they are the pirates. They are the ones making the raids. Yeah. So what happens is they send them back. 
He gets back to Earth. He, 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 tell, he tries to explain to him what happened. They was frozen for five hundred years, mm -hmm. and they think nobody, he's a spy for the other. Nobody guy. believes him, right? So, so, so nobody trusts him. Nobody believes him. He's an outsider from both sides, mm -hmm. and they distrust him. So, and he's trying to find his roots, and he, you know, he goes to visit. He, he, they're in Chicago, and he goes to visit uh, where his family used to live. He goes to the cemetery and finds the graves of his family members. Yeah, and it comes home to him that everyone he knows is dead. His entire world is gone. Basically, the Earth is irradiated or half destroyed. Yeah, half destroyed. Humans live in um, little domes, tiny domes um, that are yeah, yeah cordoned yeah, off in, in cer certain areas. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Buck, the reality of how bad his situation is, really start to sink into him. Yeah. And then they put him on trial for being a spy, and they convict him for being a spy and sentence him to death. The the robot, the uh, artificial intelligence council. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, they they don't believe him. So now he, he's a man without a country, and he's being killed by his own people, who he's trying to help. Right. And so what he does is he hatches a plan to go aboard the princess's ship to try and get to the bottom of what's going on. And, and, and so far, I'll just interrupt for a second, but you're exactly right. I mean, you've got a classic fish out of water, mm -hmm. and you're throwing rocks at him, and the rocks just keep getting bigger and sharper. And yeah, exactly, but it's good drama. and. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the action in Buck Rogers, the, the entire, all the action sequences, they add up to about 10 minutes mm -hmm. in the entire film, and most of it's right at the end. Yeah. The big battle at the end and out of space. A little Star Wars y space battle. Yeah, yeah. But, but this was done separate from Star Wars. Sure. You see what I'm saying? So, so what happens is Buck gets on the ship, and the princess is looking to overthrow her father, the Emperor, and she wants a strong man, a tough guy who's got some guts to back her up as muscle. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? She's looking for Buck as that man, and he, she divulges to him the truth of what's going on, that they are the pirates making the raids. Yes. That there are no pirates, you know? They, 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 they've been pretending to do that to lure, to lure them into an alliance mm -hmm. with them. And, and what happens She's is, helpless against the many charms of Gil Gerard. Yeah, I yeah, well, he's a good-looking guy. Yeah. He's very charming. And, and what happens is, is that <clears throat> once he realizes what their plan is, and they're going to launch the attack. Mm -hmm. He plants bombs, these like warheads that they got in the backs of the spaceships right. that they're sending them out, so that they get out a little ways and blow up, knowing fully well that they're going to figure out that he did it and kill him. You know, but he's doing this because he real. This is why I like this, love the story so much. He's doing this because he realizes that these are his people. Uh -huh. Even if they tried to kill him, even if they don't recognize he's him. He's got to do what's right. He's got to do what's right. And in that moment, he becomes the great hero, yeah. the great legend that Buck Rogers really is. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And it works as a story, and it works emotionally. And it's like as I was watching it, I was like rooting for him. And the movie stayed with me years after I watched it. It's a great episode, and it's got a lot of camp sensibility, too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's got cute moments. Disco it, in space. And oh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and I, I will say this about Gil Gerard and, what's her name, Aaron... Aaron Gray. Aaron Gray, yeah. They played off each other each really quite well. And yeah. I've seen Aaron Gray in interviews. She's very different from the character she plays in the show. Yeah. She, she's actually much more fun-loving and more laid-back. Right. You know, where she plays someone who's, like, very serious and very Military stiff. Military square. Yeah, kind yeah. Of. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, so she's... She, she's not like that in real life, you right. know, she lets her hair down. But I, it's like, as I watched that episode, I was like, I was, I was like rooting. I was like, yay, Buck Rogers! Right. You, know, I was cheer, you know, I was actually cheering for him. Yeah. I was actually cheering for the, the people he's saving. Yeah. And the fact that they recognize him and accept him in the end, you know, they finally do. And, and the thing is, is in the world that we live in, Without the principle of self-sacrifice, you know, Rufus J. Spears was talking about this. He's a history professor. History professor. Without the principle of self-sacrifice, the world we live in, the society we live in, will eventually fall apart. You know, people have to be willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of the whole. Otherwise, everything gets reduced to the lowest common denominator of, of collective malice, ignorance, mm. greed, vendettas, and selfishness. Right. You know, and that... But the thing is, is I was so glad that they didn't have someone come on and say, and this is the message of the movie. At the no, end. you don't and need it, that. It, 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 
but but I'm saying you give them the information, yeah, and you let people come to what conclusions they want. You know, that's that's and the way. It's a foregone conclusion because you've gone through the journey with the character, yeah. and you I think you have no choice but to yeah. come to the same conclusion. I mean, you love Buck Rogers too. I mean, not as much as I did. So I grew up on it, really, though. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I'm talking about I'm talking about the, just the pilot. I'm talking about mm -hmm. right here, the movie. And, you know, was, the first was season was good. was pretty darn good yeah, too. Yeah, it was. It was good. But what I'm saying, I like the I, I like the TV show. I like the first season. But what I'm saying is, is I thought the writing of Buck Rogers was just as good as the writing of Star Wars. Uh huh. And I thought the directing, the way it was put together, was also pretty good. They didn't have near the budget Star Wars had. Yeah. But I think they had about half the budget they had. But they still did a good job with it. Yeah. And, you know, I personally, I, I could still watch it to this day. It's interesting you mentioned Buck Rogers as an example because, well, uh, I think we were both quite young when it first came out. And it was really influential, yeah. I think, for sort of all the the stories that they had on there were became the model of other types of stories mm. that I'd be watching. But also, um, Buck Rogers, since you mentioned Older is Better, was also based on a, like a 1930s yeah, yeah, serial. Yeah, yeah, I think serious. it was the same name, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Which was probably quite different, but I wonder... See, I don't know anything about that original Well, one, I, I did saw the original serial. It was it was about the level of the original Flash Gordon. It worked for what it was, uh -huh. but, but the uh, movie was better. But we, we've got to wrap this up, so I, I uh -huh. would like to talk about what things need to be done to improve the situation. Okay. I think what really what we need is another youth division. We, Hollywood needs to bring in some fl fresh blood, like they did after Easy Rider, you know, which which brought us films like American Graffiti and Silent Running. So we need a purge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we need a changing of the guard, not necessarily a purge. Right. <laughs> but uh, we we also need to have uh, people who are very intelligent, who are very literate, you know, who want to do good works. You know, at the helm and looking at these scripts and saying, "No," <laughs> yeah. to the writing. You know, you, you know, like Kurosawa did, where he he appointed someone. Hey, and you know, this is interesting. He pointed an enemy, not a friend. Somebody to say, "You know what? You're full of so." This, this just isn't yeah. working. This isn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, and we we need to go back to that. Uh, we, we also, I think, one of the things we need to do is also give filmmakers more freedom. We need to get good filmmakers and give them more freedom. And I think we need, particularly the film, the film of science fiction, but also in Hollywood, mm. we need to have more B movies made. Well, maybe our bad filmmakers have too much freedom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but the thing is, is uh, they're self-imposed. They're putting self-imposed restraints on themselves. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? We need to get good f filmmakers and give them the freedom right. to experiment and take risks. Okay. And also, I think we really need to go back to doing special effects for sci-fi the old way, with actual models and in-camera shots. I know it's more time-consuming. I know you can't do as much with it. Yeah. But at the same time, it was art through adversity. You know, it's interesting because it's like that scene of the Death Star in Star Wars where the two TIE fighters come out from that. Yeah. You know, we, we hear this, the soundtrack with that, Wah! you know, just these two TIE fighters. That sucked me in. Yeah. It got me way more involved. Yeah. Then when I see all this CGI crap of I see like thousands of little ships mm. running around everywhere. And there's a, fa a virtual camera is panning and, and moving in ways that yeah. a real camera never could. Yeah. And, uh, it, it just, it leaves you cold. Yeah, well, well it, it, it just becomes <clears throat> sensory overload at mm -hmm. that point. And, and it's CGI crap. It doesn't connect with your heart. It doesn't connect with... Emotionally, it is, it's just like... I can even see the drop and, and you know, from the Phantom Menace to the Attack of the Clones when they dropped the model work and went to 100% CGI, yeah. just how much worse it got, as yeah. an example. Yeah, but I, I, I think that we really need... I, 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 think, I think the trick is that we really just need to change over. And we, we, we need to... I, I think we really need to just try and make dramas again and morality tales. I, I, I want to plug one more... TV episode that I really liked okay. from the Partridge family. And uh, this was a true story. This guy was an orphan. He grew up in an orphanage, and the, the Partridge family was hiring him as a songwriter. And he was working all these jobs, but he never had any money. They couldn't figure out. He's working like five different jobs, but he does, he's always broke. They couldn't figure out why. And at the end of the episode, you find out why. Because the, the vacant lot next to the, the orphanage they grew up with, every month, he would build a new playground set for the orphans that lived there. You know, and this is a true story. This guy really did this. Yes. 
And, you know, and I was like, wow, this guy's a hero. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? It's like, how often do we look out in our world, our right. society, and say that? I think we figured you out. You're a bleeding heart softie. <laughs> well, no, no, you're a, you're a hero. You're a good guy. Right. You, you know, and, and it's interesting to the kids that grew up in the orphanage. You know, mm -hmm. they thought he was rich. Mm -hmm. They thought he had lots of money. Well, he was rich inside. Mm -hmm. You know, he definitely was that. But, you know, he, he actually was just spending everything he was earning, you know, so he could make this playground for these kids. Because right. when he was a kid, an orphan there, he didn't have a playground to play at. And, and it's like, wow, that stayed with me the rest of my life. Sure. You know, it's like, how, how often do we, do we see that anymore? You know, Brilliant. and I, I think we really need to look for, I, I think we really need to go back and really look for stories that have something to say. So we need moral themes, um, we need attention to technique and detail. And we need slower pacing and smaller budgets, <laughs> you know, and less special effects. More character development. And more character development, yeah. And stories that, that have something to say, stories that matter a little yeah. bit more than just, that, that aim to do something more than merely entertain for two or hours. Or to hit the, hit the medium. And, and, I, and I really think that we're screwing up our kids by program, their brains, it's like, it's like uh, clipping a tree. You know, if you clip a tree a certain way, it'll be stuck with that programming the rest of its life. If we were wiring them that they need to be entertained every 10 seconds, that's how they're going to go through life. And mm -hmm. that's a very bad thing. Yes. So on that note, uh, this has been Tyler and Josh discussing older is better. And thanks very much. We'll see you next time.